Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us here at Security Live Live, Security Live Live from reInvent 2024. My name is Brian Mendenhall. I am the worldwide head of security and identity partnership specialist organization here at AWS. I am so excited for this show. I am here with Himanshu. Himanshu, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Brian. My name is Himanshu. I lead the team of our security and identity specialists. We help customers and partners orchestrate native AWS security services along with partner tools to provide better security outcomes for our customers. And we are joined today with one of our partners. Yeah, great to be here, guys. Thanks for having me. My name is Trevor Milestone. I run our cloud partnerships at Security AI. That includes, obviously, AWS, but also increasingly cloud and SI ecosystem partners. Really excited to chat. Welcome, Trevor. And for the clarity, it's security.ai. Security.ai. Awesome. Just uh, curious, like, you know, like I was looking at the, the notes and we had our first conversation. Uh, curious what what made that name like you know like what was uh, what was behind the journey of the name yeah well our ceo might be the first person to say it might be a little ill-advised at this point because of where we've gone so we are a data security company so foundationally um that's what we're doing at the core um but we've extended into a number of different areas but security is at the heart of, of everything that we do from a platform perspective which is the the genesis of the name awesome and uh, i'm assuming that the AI portion of that is how you are automating security and bringing better outcomes faster and sooner. Definitely. Um, I, well, even stepping back, if you look at the, the core platform, security is a, a data command center. Um, what exactly that means is, is a lot of different things. But if you think about the, the market and the big driver need for the solution, um, there's this massive growth in, in data itself, but also the number of services and systems companies are using to generate that data. So obviously, you have cloud providers like AWS, but you also have apps like MongoDB running in AWS. Um, companies also have on-prem data centers. They have dozens or, or hundreds of SaaS tools that they use. So what we do is provide a centralized platform to bring all of that data into one location and how that extends into to AI, we can we get into a little bit. Yeah, we're that's great. Cool, yeah. yeah, that's super exciting. It's uh, I think right now is really a, a super hot time when it comes to uh, data in general, especially like being uh, within AWS. We have availability zones and regions all across the world. Uh, so we understand the importance and complexity of data when it when it comes to protecting your data. Uh, and that has been completely accelerated with the advent of, of AI, generative, generative AI specifically. So I want to hear uh, how are customers figuring out when, with my data strategy, how do I securely build generative AI applications on top of that data? Yeah, so if you look at our customers today, pre-gen AI, right? Data security, getting your data house in order has always been critical. With the advent of gen AI, it's, it's become essential and very timely, right? So for companies to start leveraging all of these gen AI use cases, there's a, a few key macro trends that are important to think about. One companies are really starting to leverage proprietary data and they're their own company's proprietary data. And what's unique about this is it often contains sensitive information, classified information, PII. So if you want to leverage that for a Gen AI use case, you really got to make sure you're not putting anything bad into the model because ultimately that's going to come back out. So that's one key factor. Um, another one is this use of unstructured data. So really is taking center stage in this gen ai revolution is is unstructured data and for those not familiar structured data is you know everything tables schemas formats what you know about snowflake databricks stuff that we've worked with for years unstructured data is essentially everything else it's over 90 percent of all available data and that's things like video audio powerpoint really anything that's not in a nice table schema and format um, and companies have never really leveraged unstructured data at this scale before so they need to figure out how to discover it extract it bring that into AWS to, to run Gen AI use cases, and then you have a very fast moving uh, regulation discourse, but we'll, we'll yeah, pause there. This is actually a very relevant topic, you know, like our teams talk to customers almost every day, and uh, you know, this comes up now almost uh, often, where it's not only about like, you know, like the visibility into the data sprawl and the data lineage, but now customers are also concerned about like, you know, like maintaining compliance, which has been a really key part of like, you know, data residency and data governance uh, strategy, which is, uh, you know, we have uh, compliances such as uh, GDPR and, uh, you know, uh, CCPA, etc. So uh, I'm assuming that, like, you know, solutions like this are preparing customers to be ready for that uh, and also adhering to those compliances. Yeah, compliance is a major driver. Um, GDPR has been around. Uh, it took about 10 years to fully develop. Um, everybody has to adhere to these things and having a centralized data platform is essential to do that. You look at 
this Gen AI landscape, you have a very fast moving regulatory environment. Uh, GDPR, like I said, took 10 years to fully pull together. Um, the EU AI Act, which is just as comprehensive, came together in about six months. So companies are dealing with the data challenges that we just discussed. They're also dealing with a really, really fast moving regulatory environment that they need to stay tied to. So yeah, that's super interesting. I was I was just having a conversation about the EU AI Act yeah. uh, just prior to this this show, and so it's really interesting how quickly uh, that has has come together, has been operationalized. Are you seeing um, like uh, at the ex the rate of acceleration compared to GDPR? Is that maturity level there where organizations are saying, "I get it, I understand it"? Like I took the EU AI Act, I threw it into Chat GPT, uh, like I got it, or are do they do are they still in general? Testing, operationalizing and building AI apps that are compliant. I, I, it's definitely the latter, right? <laughs> uh, fast moving compliance, it, it's, it's always a challenge and you have to have a way to automate some of these behaviors, right? When we talk about all of these different data systems, all the different sources where this information is coming from, the, the idea that you're going to manually check all of these and, and run audits and attestations and understand if, if you're, you're compliant with these, it, it's really challenging. Um, so having a platform that has a pulse on where all your data is and then it ties right back to these frameworks it's, it's really important it sounds uh, very powerful and uh, you know very useful uh, trevor is there something that uh, you have to show that we yeah, can we take can a look pull at up a, uh, pull up a slide yeah all right oh there we go yeah, so i think you know some of the things we just discussed where you can visualize what customers are dealing with we talked before proprietary data all of these different systems unstructured data all of these different systems and structured data as well. Um, you want to leverage Gen AI, you have to find a way to discover where this data is, um, classify it, extract it, sanitize it, and bring it into AWS, bring it into Bedrock, right, to start driving a lot of these use cases. And it's not just Bedrock, right, it's all the models that, that AWS supports. So when you look at this environment, this idea of uh, dealing with all this data, operationalizing it, maintaining compliance, and then using that to drive different use cases, that's really um, the challenges that we're seeing dealing with right now. Very cool. And, and I'm assuming that discovery is one part of it, uh, but that also enables customers to then easily pro act on that and apply the right data protection policies. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Discovering the data is core, but it's not just enough to know where the data is. You have to know what sensitive, what's classified. Um, entitlements are a major portion of it. If you think about uh, an HR use case, and, and I can speak to this one because there is a large Fortune 5 bank currently dealing with this, but multiple iterations of trying to drive an internal HR chatbot. Um, you're pulling data from dozens of different systems. Some of that data is old, some of it's redundant, and some of it shouldn't be accessed by different roles and different people. If right. you think about a VP of HR versus uh, somebody working in a fulfillment center or a bank, when you query that system, you gotta make sure that the right information is being responded to. Um, so this getting your data house in order is, is really step one. Uh, and where we've taken that a little bit further is is turning that into a data pipeline, which we can just do as well. I love that application. Uh, you know, just the concept of uh, what, not just what is under the underneath my LLM and my generative AI environment, what data is it pulling from, but what data is going out, right? The, uh, uh, you know, all OWASP top 10, oh, is, is OWASP, do I need to put a coin in the jar? You, I, I'm not sure if I'm allowed, open, if that one's stuck by. Open web application, you know. Thank yeah. you, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, one of the top 10 LLM vulnerabilities is data leakage, right, which is, is terrifying. Uh, the idea that someone on the outside or maybe even on the inside is able to uh, like inject a query or do something and then unfortunately it spits out PCI, there goes social security numbers. Uh, it is it is terrifying to think of these security vulnerabilities and not knowing what data is coming out of your environment, right? hundred percent. So there's the front end, right, of making sure that you're selecting the right data, but then there's the back end, right, making sure that the responses that come through, there's, you know, protections in place as well. You hear about things like prompt injection attacks and, and hallucinations and, and this data leakage, right? Any data that goes into these models is going to come out in some form or fashion. So you really want to have, you know, some sort of uh, roadblocks or, or firewalls, for lack of a better word, in place on, on both ends of this to, uh, to to address. And maybe if we pull up uh, the second slide, we can talk through that as well. It's up there. It's already up there. Um, well, so we can kind of visualize what what we're seeing in, like I said, this iteration of, of customers. So you have this core data command center, builds a knowledge graph. You have all this context around your data. Okay, now I got to bring that data 
into Amazon to leverage Bedrock or, or these different models that, that Amazon provides, um, there's a process, that data selection, that chunking, that indexing. Um, you're also putting these into vector DBs, right? You're selecting from a variety of different models based on, on different use cases. Um, and then there's also a need, like you said on the back end, to have these contextual aware firewalls. So if everything else on the front didn't work, you're gonna catch it on the back end with these retrieval firewalls and prompt injection firewalls. So we're actually starting to see, I'm gonna say it, defense in depth within generative AI environments. That's exactly how we would describe it. Hey, there we go. Where's my five bucks? I get paid for that, right? <laughs> this, is, uh, this is actually very uh, timely, you know, like because uh, as customers now are adopting, you know, generative AI uh, and application building applications, uh, I think we're seeing a lot of demand from them. I think one of the key other factors that comes in is that post discovery, like you know, they want to be able to make sure, like you know, like as you mentioned. Uh, the data is actually not being misused in any way or shape or form. Most of the time, customers are concerned about like intellectual property. Do you foresee like a way to also then classify this data, or can you take existing, existingly classified or classifiers into this graph uh, pipeline? Yes, yeah, so right. Really important call out. Right, entitlements is a, is a word that you're going to hear a lot of it in Gen AI because you're pulling this data from systems all over the place. Sometimes this data has been stored for 10, 15 different years. Um, and there's entitlements and controls in place. The second you take that data out of these different data systems and bring it into AWS, you lose all of that. It's the wild west. So you have to have a way, like I said, through this process, through this pipeline, to maintain those data controls. So when you bring them into these Gen AI use cases, right, entitlements become sort of part of the answer. That's great, and, and I want to say, you know, uh, we just had a conversation yesterday here at, at uh, AWS reInvent around uh, our customers' ability to prototype successfully, really quickly prototype generative AI environments that never made it to production uh, for the sole reason that they were not able to provide the security data governance on that environment, that application, uh, into a production environment. And so it's really interesting to hear uh, the, that the governance, the data governance is what is driving the adoption of production generative AI environments. I mean, if, if you look at the industry and, you know, we talk to customers about this every day. This is where we live. We also talk to AWS every day. So we're hearing this from them. And you can also look at any number of industry reports, right? Everybody is deploying Gen AI use cases. There's a lot of really exciting things happening, but a lot of that's usually happening on a curated data set, right? So you test it, you prove it out, you like it. The second you try to go take that to production, there's a whole host of, of concerns and issues. What companies are really realizing is oh, we gotta get our data house in order before we can really do these things at scale. Um, data security and privacy is, is the number one blocker to getting these POCs into production. No, that's great, Trevor. One of the other things we hear from customers is, you know, and this is something that AWS, uh, you know, helps customers as well as the flexibility and the simplicity of things, right? So uh, for a customer to get started, like, you know, what are some of the key ways that they can get started? And then also like, uh, can they go and define some of these entitlements, like you mentioned, or classifiers themselves? Yeah, so I, Another big shift, right, in Gen AI is line of business users. Um, this stuff isn't just being done by, you know, IT teams. Um, you have people trying to drive business use cases and, and get business outcomes. They're not always keyed in to a lot of these privacy challenges. So when you think about a pipeline, right, or, or the usability of these things, I, I can say what we've developed. We don't want to get too too pitchy here, but it really this Gen Core solution. It's a, a data pipeline. It allows you to go in. It's a, a simple UI, sort of a wizard that anybody can use. No coding skills required. You start to select your data sources. You define what you want to sanitize or mask. Right? You pull that in. You can select vector DBs. You choose your model, and then you can put those prop firewalls and those things in the back end. Um, the whole idea is security by design. You talked about defense and death, but how do we build a pipeline that brings this data into the clouds to leverage Gen AI use cases and, and do it securely um, and make sure it's operational and companies can do it, do it easily. That's super interesting to hear about uh, the CICD pipeline in the context of building generative AI environments that are highly compliant, uh, starting with a strong security data governance policy, right, that then is, is built into the pipeline itself so that you are confident that yours, your application is going to be secure Absolutely. in production. That's incredible. Yeah. Uh, so all of our listeners out there, quick hard plug uh, from the AWS guy. 
if you are out there and you're having uh, troubles launching something into production, uh, it sounds like there are partners that are able to help you with these with these challenges, especially starting with that data that data sovereignty or data uh, policy challenge. Yeah, I mean, we, we said we're hearing it, AWS is hearing it, and we're seeing the investment from, from AWS in the ecosystem. Um, and it's not just in the ISVs that are trying to solve for this, it's the Cloud SI ecosystem, right? The partners, you know, not your typical big GSIs who are obviously very involved, but there's there's tons of resources springing up in, in this AWS partner ecosystem to address these challenges, and uh, we're seeing the impact, and we're excited to help kind of deliver on those. And, and and like, you know, with all things security, I think that this is where the paradigm comes in, is that, you know, like how Gen AI is actually empowering some of these security use cases. I'm assuming that even in your solution, which is actually there to help, you know, have the appropriate guardrails and the data governance and the entitlement, there is going to be at some point where there are features that will automate and or shorten the time that customers need by providing some Gen AI powered features within the service itself. And, and that's actually already happening, right? We, we have to be innovating on our own in our own platform, but if you think about the classification, right? Imagine trying to manually do this, or even with a system, trying to create all these tags. So, you know, the, the solutions used a version of, of machine learning to do these things in the past, but we've now started to deploy LLM models to actually get this contextual intelligence of the data within the platform. Um, so it becomes part of the answer as well. That's incredible. So we're using generative AI in order to make generative AI. Very meta. It's Very so meta. meta. It's so meta. Like my my head is gonna explode. My glasses are gonna fly off. Uh, I don't know what to do with that. Yeah, no. I think this is a great example of like you know like enabling the technology usage and the technology adoption by leveraging that technology. And I think we you know get to hear from customers all the time like you know like hey, what are some of the good use cases of leveraging generative AI in production? And I think this is a great example of how you've actually developed this technology using foundational models and large language models to actually help the adoption of uh, generative AI. Yeah, it's it's really exciting, right? I've, I've been in this line of work for, for a number of years now, and I, I think it's everybody sees the potential of Gen AI, and we're in the first half of the first inning, but there's still a lot of question marks, and addressing this security piece is, is going to be massive in order to continue to scale and operationalize these things, and um, like I said, the earliest innings of this, this innovation, but I, I think we're solving for, for a really core need right now. Yeah, and this also enables customers to easily orchestrate security policies using key management service, using Secrets Manager, I'm assuming, and you know, you mentioned one of the things like, you know, data masking and anonymization. These are very hard problems problems, uh, you know, especially to solve at scale. Um, you know, how, how is some of that uh, being done? Is that automated, uh, automated it, it, in your? That's part of the, the machine learning and, and the new LLM in the platform. Um, leveraging this, this automation, these things can't be done on their own. So that's a huge part of it. Awesome. And I'm assuming like when it comes to like security policies, there's flexibility for customers to choose how they want to encrypt the data, Absolutely. where do they want to bring the keys from, right? Uh, like, you know, if it's like the AWS key management service, or they might be using like, you know, like HSMs, hardware security modules, etc. Yeah, it, the, tons of flexibility within the platform. And we operate with a hybrid architecture. So we're deploying pods into customers' environments. The data never leaves, which is critical, especially when you're working with, with Fortune 500 companies. Um, but a lot of flexibility in the deployment, how you operationalize this, and how you take advantage of it. So I'm curious, uh, you know, from an industry lens, are there industries that you are seeing are leveraging this type of tooling and getting to production faster than other industries? Like, where is this really taking off? So there's definitely an industry lens that, as a company, we've always had a really strong focus in financial services, but we operate across the board. I mean, you can look through the list of Fortune 500, you'll find a, a customer of ours in virtually every vertical. Um, but I think every company is pushing the limits of what they can do. What we are seeing in, in the early innings, right, is a lot of customer service use cases, a lot of, even if you're a financial services company, right? Um, and now you're seeing the testing in, in the POCs around some of these more complex ones, the stuff that's, that's really gonna be transformative but it keeps coming back to question one. We've got to get our data house in order yeah. before we really take this stuff to scale. No, I think like yeah, any industry that has intellectual property, I would see like, you know, like will be a yeah. good fit. Uh, but you know, like you said, more regulated uh, industries like financial services are definitely the ones taking the lead. Yep. Awesome. Well, uh, we are just at time and I just want to thank Trevor so much. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks uh, for having us. Yeah, and uh, that's it for this show. Thank you again. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone.